Welcome uh, to this webinar on circularity, transforming electronics procurement for a sustainable future. My name is Bob Mitchell. I'm the CEO of the Global Electronics Council. I was first personally introduced to the concept of circularity and the promise of a circular economy in the early 2000s. Uh, I read a now famous book that may probably many of you have already read as well by William McDonough entitled Cradle to Cradle, Remaking the Way We Make Things. And needless to say, as a sustainably minded person, uh, it was exciting for me to think about a future that held that promise. Uh, but working in the technology manufacturing field, uh, then I also recognized how far we had to go to truly recognize um, and uh, realize uh, truly circular electronics. Um, we had at that point made it common to reclaim precious metals from circuit boards, as an example, through the recycling process. We're piloting leasing models, um, and we're establishing design for recyclability standards. Um, and yet, we're, we're still pretty very, very far from the that I held in my hand, which claimed to be circular in nature itself, that you could take that very book, right, and, and reclaim it because electronics are complicated, right, much more complicated than, 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 than that book that uh, sort of held that ambition. But fast forward to today, and we are growing we believe ever closer to the potential um, with materials design and supply chain capabilities to create those loops for critical circular materials such as cobalt and aluminum and steel as, as well as interest from purchasers the future is getting clear uh, manufacturers are reacting by embracing this direction and even setting public goals related to circular economy uh, but what's missing is a clear definition of what um, is an electronic product that's designed and placed on the market with circularity in mind. Um, so uh, well, let's think also about what purchasers need in terms of guidance on how to find and select those products. And uh, today we're really excited to be able to dive into these needs. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And I'm going to ask all the panelists to come on camera just for a moment. And again, if we could, there we go. Okay, we got the slide advanced. Um, so you already uh, have seen me, Bob Mitchell. Um, we uh, are going to be able to explore this topic with a great slate of speakers from across our community. Um, first, we're going to hear from Maddie Dillon. He's GEC's uh, Vice President of Criterion Category Development. He's going to talk to us on uh, how the EP Eco Label System is evolving its criteria to provide that simple market signal for purchasers on circular products. Next, Raleigh Nadenova will provide a detailed overview um, of the Circular Electronics Partnership and how it is galvanizing a common roadmap across the industry on this topic. Next, uh, Kaushik Ramakrishnan, GEC's Senior Director of Strategic Growth, and John Watt, ITU's Circular Procurement Consultant, will introduce several guides aimed at assisting purchasers to embed circular considerations into their purchasing cycles. And we're excited today because we are officially releasing the GEC cir circular. It's one of the reasons to have this uh, along with continuing to, to move the public forum together. And you'll see that's complementary to ITU's guide in Kaushik and John's discussions. And then finally, we're really pleased to have Beth Eckel here, Ohio Health's uh, sustainable procurement advisor who will give us a purchaser's perspective on this critical topic. To all the panelists off camera, each one of them as they present, and then again at Q&A. So let's go on to the next slide, please. So just a quick note on GEC, for those who don't know the Global Electronics Council. Uh, again, we're thrilled to host this public dialogue. It's part of what we do, not just uh, being stewards of the EP label system, but also um, to further sustainable um, product development and uh, purchasing, and these uh, global dialogues help us, I think, do that. We are an independent, international, impartial nonprofit. Um, we are the stewards of EAPT, um, we have uh, staff located around the world in the United States, Canada, Belgium, and the Netherlands. And uh, um, uh, we are governed by uh, highly diverse non industry representatives uh, from the GEC Board of Directors. Next slide, please. So we can't do it alone. Um, 
Um, and so this is a, a, just a snapshot of the different organizations we work with around the world. I'll call out, for instance, the Circular Electronics Partnership. Raleigh is here today to talk through that and the roadmap. Uh, Circular and Fair IT Pact is another one um, for sort of talking in that circularity space. But all these partners and many more really go into um, rounding out and, and, and complementing the strengths of GEC and us complementing theirs as well. Excited to continue to work with these partners. Uh, next slide. So as I mentioned before, GEC is the steward of the EP Ecolabel, which has played, we feel, is a key role to date in driving early circularity criteria into electronics um, across the globe. And we'll continue to up in the coming months, hear more about that um, in our updated circularity criteria from Patty Dillon. Um, but what makes our uh, broad system special really is the ability really, and the impact that we provide. And, um, we're going to hear more about this slide from Kaushik Ramakrishnan in a little bit, um, but you know, a broad range both from the multi-stakeholder consultation aspect um, to how we, uh, in terms of how we develop our criteria, all the way through how we implement uh, criteria through third-party verification. Um, you'll learn more about. And next slide, we'll just give a kind of brief overview then on EP itself. So EP. Um, has our non selection of sustainable electronics registered across the broadest categories. And with our ever evolving criteria, it makes the system the, what we what we feel is the market signal for purchasers to identify as both sustainable and circular products. Um, so next, I'm going to hand it over to Patty Dillon. He'll give us more insight into our criteria evolution related to circularity. Patty. Great. Thank you so much, Bob. Let's see. Uh, oh, there I am. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Uh, so before we hear from our guest panelists um, and more about the circularity guides, we wanted to provide a quick update on the EP circularity criteria. Next slide, please. So uh, EP criteria fall into four broad sustainability impact areas. Of course, circularity, which is the subject of our uh, discussions today, but EP criteria also address climate, which is about reducing greenhouse gas emissions throughout the manufacturer supply chain, as well as during product use. Chemicals of concern to eliminate the use of toxic chemicals in products and manufacturing processes, and finally, responsible supply chains, uh, which addresses uh, the responsible sourcing of materials, uh, fair labor practices, and worker health and safety in the electronic supply chain. Now, GEC, we organize our criteria into these four sustainability impact areas, uh, really for the purpose of criteria development and trying to kind of get a handle on everything we need to do, uh, but uh, they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, so, for example, uh, circular strategies, I mean, we all know they contribute to climate change mitigation by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, from uh, material extraction and manufactured components by basically extending the life of uh, products uh, and or using recycled content, for example. And an important strategy for promoting circular materials is also to remove hazards uh, and persistent chemicals uh, from materials, uh, such as fluorinated flame retardants and uh, PFAS. Uh, and so, again, not mutually exclusive. Next slide. So a few years ago, uh, GEC uh, launched Next slide. Oh, thank you. That's where I want to be. Thanks. Uh, so a few years ago, GEC launched a new process for developing EP criteria. We've brought the criteria development process in-house for efficiency and agility, essentially to ensure that EP criteria address the changing needs of the market, government policy, and represent the latest science and best practices. And with this new process, uh, GEC is developing horizontal criteria that will apply across all of our ICT product categories, rather than traditionally we had product specific criteria. We think it's much more efficient since most of the impacts and performance criteria are applicable across IT categories. Um, and then we customize our criteria as needed by product. 
uh, you know, great example will, would be customization of uh, use of recycled content. It's more, it's easier to uh, put recycled content into some products than others. Uh, GEC's pro uh, our process um, starts with the preparation of state of sustainability research, uh, which I've provided screenshots on the left-hand side of this slide. These reports provide the science and the evidence to support the criteria that we develop. The reports identify for each of the sustainability impact areas, what, what are the sustainability impacts? What are the strategies that you are proven to demonstrate a reduction in the impacts? Um, and what, um, what supporting standards or methodologies are out there that support uh, the conformity assessment of the, uh, the, the criteria? And finally, what criteria do we propose to address the impacts? Uh, then um, GEC, we then convene a broad range of stakeholders to contribute to the development of criteria. We open up the process for public consultation at key milestones. And on the right, you'll see uh, the uh, sort of the output of our uh, voluntary consensus criteria development. Uh, the climate criteria, as you see here, were actually published in 2023, uh, and the remaining criteria will be published in 2024. Um, and these criteria, again, are going to be implemented across uh, the EP ICT product categories and replace the existing criteria. Now, in the chat, uh, we'll go ahead and post the links to the circularity state of sustainability research and the draft criteria for circularity so you have them right in your hands. Next slide, please. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, quickly look at the uh, uh, snapshot of the evolution of EP criteria. Where we've been is on the left, uh, and that represents like 2007 or 6 to 2017, and uh, where uh, we are now on the right. Uh, and um, we brought in the topics that we cover since the early days of EP, and we basically have increased the ambition uh, for topics that EP has always covered. Now, the color coding is actually each of our first four sustainability impact areas. Uh, circularity is shown in blue. Uh, so EP has always included criteria on recycled content plastic, also designed for recycling and responsible end of life recycling of electronic products. Our current criteria, we've going further in ambition, requiring higher recycled plastic content levels, but we've also expanded into recycled content metals and critical minerals, as well as uh, product longevity and repairability. Uh, and, and so we've really uh, expanded. Next slide. So this uh, final slide of mine, I just a really quick snapshot of our updated create circularity, excuse me, criteria, uh, we include multiple strategies to reduce the impact of electronic product uh, materials and components from use of recycled materials and products, uh, which as mentioned is expanding to include, include critical metals and base metals such as aluminum, magnesium alloys and steel. The criteria also promote product longevity and repair including uh, design criteria to facilitate disassembly and recycling, uh, more durable, portable products, the use of longer life batteries and other life extension uh, strategies, um, and such as manufacturers providing access to repair services and spare parts for components with a higher incident needing replacement. We've also introduced for the first time, and I think the first time for an electronics eco-label, water stewardship criteria. So we're really looking forward to releasing the final circularity criteria later this year. So stay tuned uh, for uh, its release uh, later this year. Thanks so much, Bob, back to you. Excellent, thank you, Patty. So uh, go ahead and take a, a few moments when you get a chance to click on those links, uh, save them to your browser um, and uh, get a, a bit more color on uh, Patty's presentation and some of the the background on the criteria and the state of sustainability research. Next up, you know, we're really um, thrilled and have been to be a supporting partner of the Circular Electronics Partnership. We have Representative uh, Raleigh Nadenova from the 
from the, from CEP, um, the shortened version of that organization. Um, uh, she's a communications and operations lead and is going to talk to us a bit about the partnership and the roadmap. So Raleigh, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks a lot, Bob, and, and hello to everyone. I'm really delighted to, to join this webinar today on behalf of the Secretariat of the Circular Electronics Partnership. And I'm particularly excited because it, it marks an important launch of the Purchaser Guide for Circularity. This is a key milestone for the GEC-led efforts on stimulating circular procurement for electronics. But uh, I'll dive into that in a bit. And let me just quickly first introduce the partnership for those who are not familiar with it. Um, so really, CEP, um, you might ask why we need another uh, organization working on this topic. There's a lot going on already. Well, this is exactly why CEP was created uh, three years ago now. We had recently a birthday. So it was established in 2021 uh, due to the fact that um, uh, in 2019, the World Economic Forum, PACE, ITU, and WBCSD worked together on a report called the New Circular Vision for Electronics. And that report called for a global reboot of the electronics value chain. Something else that emerged as part of that collaboration is that the organizations that were collaborating realized that there is a lot already going and a lot of organizations are working with private sector members on individual projects uh, towards circular electronics. While this is great, uh, it creates a risk of overlap uh, in the project objectives between initiatives and uh, there's high risk of misalignment in project outcomes which could potentially add more confusion uh, to this space instead of driving convergence and progress. Of course, uh, as we can imagine, this is not very helpful. It hampers collective progress towards the mutual goal of um, transforming the industry to a circular economy. And the time we have for transformation is quite short. So the margin for inefficiencies uh, is really, really small. And in, in, a, in essence, the coordination between initiatives is really imperative so that we ensure that all organizations working on these issues can contribute with real value towards the, the larger uh, industry-wide strategy to transform the sector. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, after this collaboration, ITU, the World Economic Forum, and WBCSD joined forces with other leading organizations uh, working with business on sustainable solutions. So this is the Responsible Business Alliance, the Global Enabling Sustainability Initiative, and of course, the Global Electronics Council. So together, they established a credible coordination platform, which have complementary organizational, uh, con contributing with complementary organizational expertise. So this laid the foundation for the CEP that we have today. And at the beginning of uh, 2020, the founding partners convened more than 80 individuals from over 30 of their respective companies to align on a vision for a circular electronics industry by 2030 and to co-develop a roadmap for how to get there. And the outcome of this collaboration was the circular electronics roadmap, which I'll also dive into a second. But in brief, the circular electronics partnership is a coordination platform for its partners, industry members, and the wider stakeholder network, driving collective and converging action on global initiatives for circular electronics. So through a holistic approach, we connect the dots between existing initiatives, ensuring alignment and coherence across the industry. And the launch of the purchaser guide today uh, is an excellent example of the value of having such a coordination platform. Next slide. Here, just wanted to illustrate the current CEP members, which span across the electronics value chain and geographies. So together with the partners, they're the ones really providing the expertise and the vision for what the industry aims to achieve and needs support with. And besides the partners and members, uh, we're open to and are actively collaborating with other nonprofit organizations engaged in the circular transformation of the electronics industry. And you will soon see them uh, being formally recognized as alliance partners across our communication channels. Next slide. So how we work, um, CP brings cohesion to its partners initiatives for circular electronics through the CP roadmap, uh, which as already described was developed by more than 35 organizations in the industry. 
And the CP roadmap identifies 40 industry-wide barriers for companies in their circular transition that need collective action to be addressed by 2030. And since the launch of CP in 2021, these 40 roadmap actions across six pathways along the product lifecycle are now being addressed by pre-competitive collaboration projects, which involve partners, the private sector members, and external stakeholders. And the launch of the purchaser guide today is an example of, of such a project. The CP roadmap essentially outlines our agenda towards 2030. And at the same time, it is an invitation to other organizations who work on similar issues to collaborate uh, on these overlapping interests, since we really can't do this alone. Next slide. And in 2023, an important update for everyone, CP developed a second version of its roadmap. So um, a lot has happened in the past five years, especially when it comes to the common understanding on circularity. And at the same time, CP has a lot of new members who've joined. So we wanted to ensure that we include their perspectives and contributions to the agenda towards 2030. So the update is really not meant to be an overhaul of the roadmap. Uh, essentially, we're still focusing on the same set of actions, but refining them and making them fit for today's reality. And uh, the design and some structures have been updated, but on the content level, we really continue the original uh, roadmap in, in essence. And we've already updated, um, we've already started using this updated roadmap internally, uh, but the external publication is planned for 15th of April. So save the date. Uh, we'll be doing that at the World Circular Economy Forum and we'll have uh, the possibility to launch that on a brand new website. So we're really excited to offer that to all stakeholders who want to understand better what's happening uh, in the space on circular electronics. Next slide, please. So here is an overview of the updated CP roadmap. I know this is quite overwhelming and uh, definitely not intended to be fully digested at this moment, but I'll try to quickly orient you and position the topic of today. And you see that the roadmap consists of six pathways, which are phrased as a call to action for the industry to first design for circularity, drive demand for circular products and services, scale responsible business models, increase the official collection rate, and aggregate for reuse and recycling, and scale material and scale secondary material markets. So um, on a vertical level, we have also, also introduced in the updated roadmap a split between three action levels. So we have collective actions, company actions, and wider stakeholder asks. And in brief, collective actions are really interventions that require collaborative, collaborative industry action, as no company can uh, develop a circular economy on its own. And wider stakeholder asks are interventions for governments, NGOs, and research organizations. And then company actions in the middle are interventions for individual uh, value chain players. So ultimately the companies that will drive the transformation. And now going back to the topic of today, um, of course, the purchaser guide for circularity alongside the ITU work, which will be shared in a bit, directly respond to action 2.1 in the roadmap, calling for guidance for circular electronic procurement. And I want to know that the collaboration between GEC and ITU is a real demonstration for the value of CP as a coordination initiative, since otherwise those would have happened in isolation and are not necessarily converging towards the same outcome. And we want to congratulate everyone who's been involved uh, in making this uh, cross-organizational collaboration happen so successfully. And I'll just conclude with a final uh, note on another important publication for us. Um, so this is the circular electronic system map. And again, if you want to dive into that, please scan the code and access it on our soon to be updated website. But basically this publication outlines the industry view of what circular electronic industry could look like. And the system map uh, essentially outlines three key attributes of a circular electronic product, which are in the inner circle. Um, so focused around design, um, actual use, and recovery at end of life. And I want to highlight that the purchaser guide um, is intended to align with these attributes, which further showcases that coordination was essential in uh, developing all these pieces at the same time. And on that note, I uh, would like to thank you for the opportunity to share about CP and how um, GC contributes to uh, progress, especially on pathway two and driving um, 
demand for circular electronic products. And I really look forward to seeing how this creates a wave of impact and seeing purchaser purchasers starting to, to adopt some of these uh, great recommendations. Great, Raleigh, thank you so much. Uh, again, it's it's a privilege to be part of CEP and we're looking forward to all the progress coming up, including um, you know meeting up with CEP and many of you on the phone at some of the upcoming uh, events, both in Brussels and in Chicago around circularity. Um, so we'll move on here in our agenda. Uh, we're gonna hear a bit more about these, per these uh, circularity guides. Uh, Kaushik Ramakrishnan, our Senior Director of Strategic Growth from the Global Electronics Council is here to talk to us about an uh, uh, exciting guide we're releasing today. So Kaushik, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thank you. Thanks, Bob. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so the moment's here as uh, Rally already kind of built up, uh, built up the suspense a little bit about the purchaser guide. Uh, I'm really happy and really thrilled to be uh, officially launching the GEC Purchaser Guide for Circularity. Uh, and the link to this document, I think, will be uh, posted in the chat uh, and made accessible to, to all the uh, uh, participants of this webinar. Uh, the, the Purchaser Guide itself is designed to be a resource for purchasers uh, to engage with uh, both internal and external stakeholders on the topic of circularity and, in particular, you know, engage their suppliers and engage their supply chain uh, on, uh, you know, the topic of uh, circularity. Uh, it's also designed, uh, you know, and, and as we go into it, you'll see uh, that the document itself is structured in such a way that you can, you know, uh, have certain questions that you can use to have uh, this dialogue and engage in this dialogue with suppliers. Uh, but moving beyond just the dialogue, it also supports organizations in establishing you know, the appropriate organizational policies and organizational procedures to be able to, uh, you know, look at uh, circularity throughout the uh, procurement process, uh, as well as the use of, uh, you know, electronics and uh, ICT products. Uh, and through this process of uh, engaging your suppliers, through the process of, you know, implementing certain policies and procedures within your organization, uh, we hope that uh, the guide helps organizations to uh, embed circularity into, you know, the end-to-end -end ICT procurement process uh, uh, from the point of procurement all the way through, you know, the end of life of this uh, of this piece of, uh, uh, you know, IT asset within your organization. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, and as you've been hearing from uh, Rally, uh, uh, from CEP and others, this was a truly collaborative effort through the uh, circular, uh, uh, you know, through the CEP of which both uh, GEC and the ITU are partners. Uh, the purchaser guide is a, is, um, it, that GEC has produced and is launching today uh, is a complementary guide to the ITU's uh, Circular and uh, Sustainable Public Procurement Guide, which uh, you know, you'll hear about uh, in, in just a few minutes. Uh, and they're complementary in the sense that the GEC guide uh, really looks at uh, the process of procurement and where you uh, how you kind of build these, uh, you know, questions into the dialogue with your uh, suppliers, as well as how you use the product through the life cycle within your organization, what you do at the end of life. While, you know, the ITU's guide takes a slightly broader look, I don't want to, you know, ruin the surprise. I'll leave that for, uh, you know, John to talk about later on. But uh, just to say that this is a collaborative effort and these guides are intended uh, specifically and designed specifically to, to act as, you know, complementary resources for you know organizations uh, to use we could uh, move to the next slide please um and before you know jumping into the guide itself you know the the motivation for producing this guide uh was also uh you know comes from the core belief that we have as gac is that uh you know purchasing power and procurement power can be a can be a really strong tool to drive change when it comes to sustainability and circularity. You know, here are some statistics on you know public public procurement from the OECD. You know, specific to OECD countries and the contribution they make towards the GDP and towards the the broader economy. Uh, it's clear that procurement of you know services and assets can be a big driver for change, uh, and that's why we produced this uh, purchaser guide that was uh, specifically a tool. That purchasers can use to, you know, embed circularity into their procurement of ICT and uh, electronic uh, electronic assets. Uh, if we could move on to the next slide, 
Uh, and with that, I want to just jump a little bit into the guide itself, into the structure of the guide. Uh, the guide is uh, broken down into two parts, which you'll see uh, when you're able to access it. Uh, part one uh, focuses on procurement questions uh, and best practices that a purchaser can use in engaging their uh, suppliers. Uh, these, these are questions around uh, the attributes of the products itself that they're trying to produce, uh, purchase. These are questions around uh, the vendor's broader commitments towards circularity and broader practices towards circularity. So the first part of the guide uh, is the set of questions that can be used to, uh, you know, kickstart this dialogue at the point of, you know, trying to make purchasing decisions and trying to make purchasing, you know, uh, uh, have those purchasing uh, engagement with your suppliers. Uh, and part two of the guide is now, if you, uh, as an organization, purchased uh, a set of, you know, IT and electronic assets and, you know, use them through the life uh, uh, within your organization to also look at what happens at the end of life of these assets and how you can build a uh, careful treatment of these assets at the end of life into you know, policies and procedures within your organization. So we wanted to make sure that the guide is comprehensive through the life cycle of the asset within your organization. And that's why we've uh, you know, looked at you know, these both, both these uh, sides of that equation, the procurement aspect, as well as the end of use uh, aspect of it. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. And just to you know, give a quick example of how it is structured, you know, I mentioned earlier that it's designed as questions. You know, this is just one question that I pulled up from the guide as an example on you know, the recovery of scarce resources. So it addresses what kind of questions you could have, which you can see you know, circled uh, in, the, in, in the red circle in the left of the screen, what kind of questions you could potentially pose to your suppliers and how you could initiate that discussion. But also, you know, when your suppliers uh, are responding to you and your, and your suppliers are sharing information back with you, what kind of supporting evidence or what kind of supporting documentation you might want to ask for uh, in order to actually get a little bit deeper and get, get a more credible understanding of your suppliers, product suppliers, you know, treatment of this particular issue. So this is how you will see as we as you get into the guide, most of the, um, most of the uh, topics in part one of the guide are structured along this uh, this format of you know looking at the objective of what that product of that particular attribute, and then getting into you know what questions you can use to engage your suppliers and what kind of supporting documentation you might want to request from from them uh, on this topic. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, and you know in this part one, it covers a number of material issues. I won't go into all the details here, but it covers a number of material issues on product attributes such as the longevity or the the use of scarce resources or the use of sustainable packaging in the product, uh, as well as the commitments of, of the vendor and the supplier themselves to you know, the use of renewable energy, for example, or material recovery programs or broader CSR programs of uh, the vendor. And there are a, a, a number of questions related to all of this that you could use to engage your suppliers. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, and part two of the document, uh, you know, looks at the end of use policies, and again, here covers a number of material issues such as, uh, you know, responsible end of use options, or uh, you know, reuse and repair options, or refurbishment options, and things like that. Uh, again, there are policies and procedures related to this that uh, we invite uh, you to look into and see how you might want to embed into your own organization's policies and procedures. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, and finally, I wanted to round this off by connecting the purchaser guide to what you know Bob mentioned earlier on. The purchaser guide gives a lot of resources to have these conversations, uh, but sometimes we understand that it's also uh, you know a fairly uh, 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 time-consuming or a fairly resource-intensive process to have this discussion with your suppliers. It may also involve often having a certain level of technical expertise as a buyer to be able to understand all of that supporting uh, evidence which is why a lot of organizations also choose to use an eco-label such as EP to actually achieve this goal. Um, and there are a number of reasons why, you know, uh, an eco-label like EP uh, can build credibility into, into the process. And what you see on the slide are some of those, you know, the EP eco-label is designed, the criteria are designed through a multi-stakeholder consensus-based process. So, you know, the collective wisdom of uh, a number of stakeholders goes into setting that criteria. Uh, and the criteria are designed, as uh, my colleague Patty uh, mentioned earlier, to, to look at things from uh, across the entire life cycle, but also to cover a number of material issues 
including circularity, but including things like uh, climate related criteria, uh, chemicals of concern, responsible supply chain and responsible, you know, fair practices in your supply chain, all of these packaged into one eco label. So it's an easier way for purchasers as well as product manufacturers to, you know, to connect the material issues uh, and to do this using a science based approach and an evidence based approach, which again, is what we've taken into consideration while developing the guide, but it's also very clearly built into the uh, EP criteria themselves. And the EP eco label has criteria and thresholds for criteria set at such a level that it demonstrates leadership performance. So any product that meets this uh, criteria clearly is a leader when it comes to sustainability and is a credible way for purchasers to engage with. And all of this goes through an independent third party verification process. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you know every purchaser has to look at every issue and verify for themselves that's done as part of the eco label uh, as part of the EP eco label so we feel that you know the purchaser guide is a great resource to engage your suppliers but EP uh, is a tool that many purchasers then use to to um, you know connect uh, connect the issues together in a in a more holistic uh, systematic way uh, if we can move to the next slide please me uh, which would be my last slide i just want to invite you all uh, to access this uh, purchaser guide resource. I believe the, the link has been posted on the Q&A and it could, be, uh, could probably be sent to all the webinar participants later on. What we are launching today is version one of the guide, which we're very excited to launch uh, through the partnership with CEP and ITU. Uh, and what we hope to do uh, later in the year is produce an updated version of this. You know, Paddy talked about the EP circularity criteria, the updated circularity criteria, which are due out in October of this year, and we, you know, at that point, would like to go back and update the purchaser guide to specifically reference these criteria as well. Uh, so we'll make sure to be in touch with all of you at that point when an updated guide is also available. Uh, but with that, uh, I'd like to hand it back to you, Bob. Wonderful, thank you. So uh, excited, we we're going to put a link in the Q and A, um, but also you can find that on our website as well. Um, under our purchaser guide section. So now moving on, um, I think you'll see uh, this guide really is complemented by a guide from uh, ITU. Um, we're gonna hear from John Watt, the circular procurement consultant um, at ITU. John, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bob, and good afternoon. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, John from the ITU, and uh, just to give you a a very brief overview of the of the guide that we've produced as as has been mentioned by by other other colleagues uh, in very much in collaboration in the in the same ecosystem as these other resources that have been uh, been created uh, next slide please um, so the ITU, just in case you're not aware, is the is the UN's uh, specialized agency for for ICT. So essentially, what the ITU does is sort of coordinate those kind of telecommunication improvements and, and global standards uh, in collaboration with with their member states, so national governments and a large number of companies as well. So in a, in a good position to be able to influence uh, public procurement as well as other standards. Um, next slide, please. So this particular guidance uh, that we've created, the ITU, um, it was within the uh, GovStack project. So just very quickly, and you can look at the, the, the sort of links later, the GovStack project is an initiative aimed at building kind of universal adaptable digital infrastructure. So really what that means is it promotes the use of sort of interoperable digital building blocks, which allow kind of countries to then sort of scale more sustainably their digital services and solutions. So really what it supports sustainable ICT procurement by promoting that reuse of digital goods and services. Next slide, please. So as, as was mentioned by, by Raleigh, by Krishik and others, we really did work in parallel with a large number of, uh, of organizations on this guide. And in particular, you'll see the, the, the partner organizations on this slide. So we heard from the Circular Electronics Roadmap and sorry, Partnership on, on their roadmap and the work they've been doing to bring together all these partners. And as you heard, then the, the, the work was in collaboration with the GEC to make sure that we, we complemented their guide for circularity, uh, as well as actually the GovStack project itself. There's also uh, with the, within the ITU, there's a, a series of what are called recommendations, which you can see on the ITU website. 
And these are essentially sort of technical guidance for, uh, for various different ICT sort of standards for, for operation. Uh, they're non-binding, but very much widely adhered to by the ITU members and industry. So at the process of developing this guidance, we also were working on a recommendation on circular public procurement of ICT. So next slide, please. So this particular uh, standard then uh, was really kind of providing uh, this kind of um, set of principles to maximize use, uh, usable life, maximize that use of energy efficient equipment and sort of minimize any kind of e-waste of, of ICT while increasing that kind of recyclability. So the recommendation, uh, if it's kind of the what to do, then we tried to make the, the guidance that we were producing in parallel, uh, the kind of how to of that recommendation. Next slide, please. So as well as working with all our partner organizations, such as the CEP, the GEC, et cetera, we also worked uh, in consultation with a number of, of national governments and other kind of industry and sector partners. So that meant sort of consultations with national governments on their own particular needs for ICT, for, uh, for, for procurement, uh, to make sure that the guidance was really meeting what they needed to do to improve the circularity and sustainability of their procurement. So based on that, then we, we created the guide uh, to really meet their, their requirements, as well as actually then picking sort of new and existing case studies of, of good practice from them as well. Um, so all, all that collaboration um, created then the, the guidance as it, as it is formed. Next slide, please. So the, Based on the, the consultations, the governments themselves identified that actually there was kind of three main things that, that they're really looking for to support their work. The first was around that policy and strategy aspect. So what does good policy making look like in terms of sustainable ICT procurement? Uh, and how can they develop strategy and guiding principles which support that sustainability and circularity? The second part then was creating the conditions. So what are some of the good practices and pathways to capacity building, to target setting and other types of work that help sort of bridge that gap between the policy and on the ground action. And then we dig deeper into that actual procurement process. So the planning, the execution of sustainable and circular procurement of ICT. And that's where we try to bring in some of those elements and links and different resources, such as the GEC, the CEP guidance and others, and really trying to be a, almost a sort of uh, sort of collaboration and sort of um, uh, uh, resource that brings together all of those different um, different elements. Next slide, please. So just very quickly, some of the subsections then policy and strategy then are around things like taking leadership, aligning goals and targets and developing, developing a roadmap. So some of those things that uh, governments need to do to get started on this journey. Um, and we take a lot of the, uh, the elements in this from existing good practices that we were able to identify and, and in some cases uh, have direct interviews with uh, national governments on, this, on these topics. Next slide, please. Then there's the actual capacity building to make it happen. So within that kind of creating the conditions um, sort of section, then we talk about managing the government, uh, setting priorities and engaging stakeholders. Uh, so some of those elements um, within, within that uh, chapter really are that kind of practical uh, systemic level of, of what needs to be done to, to create those uh, procurement conditions. Next slide, please. And then finally, in the procurement processes section, then we go through that typical procurement cycle. So some of the planning elements, so the assessing needs, engaging with suppliers, uh, assessing some of the, the actual kind of market within the, uh, within the member states or the countries that we're working with, um, as well as then maybe some of the other elements around uh, what's out there in terms of labels, other good practices within their own their own countries or supply chains they can they can drill into. So all those kind of first sort of pre-procurement aspects that need to be taken into account. 
then we go into the solicitation and evaluation side of things. So uh, what, what needs to happen in terms of specifications and what uh, and how do you actually then measure some of and verify some of those suppliers um, uh, bids around circularity and sustainability. And then we go through the award and contract management cycles. So again, just looking at some of those sources of, of good criteria, good methodology that governments can, can make use of. So as I say, we've tried to be a kind of, uh, sort of compile as many of those resources into one place as possible to, to allow governments to sort of dip into this and see what's, what's out there and, and available. And then we find we finish with that kind of review of performance. So what are some of those methods and other good examples out there from governments that are able to use KPIs and use different methods to, to improve and, and uh, keep that procurement cycle on a upward trajectory in terms of circularity. Next slide, please. Then finally, uh, just another um, um, bit of information that the, based on the guidance, the ITU was also able to create uh, an e-learning module on, on the same topic. So this is, uh, this is available on the ITU website. So you'll see uh, at the end of the presentation, there's some QR codes as well. Um, and this was essentially developing the, the guidance into, a, into a, um, a, a set of modules that can be used online for e-learning. Next slide, please. And yet, just very quickly, you can see here then some of the links to the, the guide as well as the IT recommendation and the GovStack project. And uh, we'll post them as well after the webinar on the on the different links too. So yeah, just a very quick tour of, uh, of what's out there available on the guide and uh, very happy to field any questions after this. Thank you. Fantastic. Th thank you so much, John. Um, again, rich set of resources out there um, all kind of pulled together through this circular electronics partnership. And, and let's not forget how important it is to get the perspective from those who may be using guides like this, which is why we have Beth Eckel here, um, again, an advisor, um, from Ohio health, uh, supply chain services specifically, uh, for sustainable procurement strategic sourcing. So Beth, uh, really happy to have you here. We're going to hand the floor over to you to hear your remarks. Thank you. Great. Great. And thank you. I hope you can hear me. Okay. I'm, I am um, been taking a lot of notes and I'm looking forward to expanding the circularity efforts, our circularity efforts using all the resources you guys have proposed and recommended. And I'm pleased to be able to share with you today what Ohio Health has accomplished in circularity. But before I do, let me introduce you to Ohio Health. Next slide. So Ohio Health is based in Columbus, Ohio. We are a nationally recognized not-for-profit charitable healthcare system. As a system, we have 15 hospitals and 200 care sites across the state of Ohio, serving over 4 million people. Our mission is to improve the health of those we serve. We strive to be a leader in sustainability, to support a safe and healthy work environment and make a positive impact in the communities that we serve. Next slide. And at Ohio Health, we care about sustainability. Um, we recognize that climate change is the greatest threat to human health. So we signed the US Health and Human Services pledge to commit to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions 50% by 2030 and to be net zero by 2050. We also recognize that greenhouse gas emissions, re, you know, reducing them, we must consider sol circular solutions in order to achieve it. So reducing greenhouse gas emissions, improving patient health, both can be achieved through circular solutions. And that's why we care. Next slide. So our sustainability approach is really focused on five key areas. And I would like to share with you today our accomplishments with responsible purchasing. Next slide. So through responsible purchasing at Ohio Health, we achieved ambitious goals. We successfully implemented, we met a three-year board goal that essentially established a brand new sustainable procurement program. We have a new sustainable procurement policy. We wrote sustainability criteria for goods and services that we're buying. And we, um, because hospitals buy thousands of goods and services, we also prioritized what we buy um, by focusing on three key 
sustainability areas. One is reducing emissions, another is eliminating chemicals of concern, and the third is conserving resources. And all three of those um, tie into uh, supporting circularity. And I'm only gonna touch on two. So next slide, please. So of our electronics, um, we are proud to conserve resources. Um, actually, I think that's, uh, let me see, next slide. We are proud to reduce, reuse, and recycle and donate our electronics. Over f uh, close to 5 million items every year are, um, go through this process, and we're pleased that we can, can reduce our waste through that, through that process. It's not only electronics that we're re reducing, reusing, and recycling, it's also textiles and plastics and metal. Of our electronics, 100% of what we collect is reused, recycled, or donated. Of our textiles, we have a laundry service that washes and we are able to reuse dozens of times each of the items. And of the plastics and metals, we have containers that we're reusing many times over in our health system to reduce waste and support circularity. Next slide. So there's one circular example I'd like to share with you, and that's sterilization wrap. Um, it's not an electronic, but we feel like the process can be similar to what an, an electronic might go through. So we collect sterilization wrap to recycle it. And sterilization wrap, if you're not familiar, is, is a wrap that's used to wrap medical devices before they're used in the operating room, so they remain sterile. And they're unwrapped before the patient even enters the room. So all this sterile wrap is clean when it's removed and then it's thrown away. So we're taking this polypropylene and recycling it. And our service provider is, is um, taking it and using it and remanufacturing it into new goods that we then buy back. So we're so the picture on the right, the one of the bags is a patient belonging bags that we're working on an opportunity to buy that back to represent a true circular economy. The bag in the lower right corner, we bought hundreds of those. And those are giveaway bags that we're, we're also buying that are made from recycled sterilization wrap. And then the upper left corner on the right is what's called a gate belt. And we just finished trialing that last week in one department. So we hope to be able to purchase this product back from the recycled sterilization wrap and reuse that but that's still in development. So next slide. Oh, but one, one thing I, before you switch slides, one thing I wanted to point out is what has been presented before is that um, the important element of this whole effort is the collaboration and the partnership with our vendors. We've worked with our haulers, our recyclers, our distributors, and our users to really make this to come to fruition. And it's been super important for us to collaborate and partner with others to make this possible else it would not have been possible to do so. So that was one point I wanted to make before going to the next slide, please. Another circularity example, um, we collect our food waste and our vendor composts it and then repurposes it back as a soil amendment, which is bought by the community. So we're able to, to really truly represent a circular economy with this particular, with our food waste. And we're pleased about that. Next slide. So with electronics, we are reducing emissions and supporting circularity in four ways. One, we're specifying EPEAT for electronics. And what's great about EPEAT is that EPEAT includes circularity in the criteria. So we know that that's en encompassed. For instance, there's one criteria that's designed for reuse, uh, repair, and recycling. And so by supporting EPEAT and working with that criteria, we know we're supporting circularity. Um, we're also um, reducing and reusing and recycling our electronics. When we reuse our electronics, um, the service provider is refurbishing that material and then giving it to underserved communities. When we recycle our electronics, some of the materials are separated and then go, go back into the economy again. For instance, lithium from batteries is pulled out and is then reused in new batteries. So we hope it's removing lithium from being mined. Um, and that's another example. And then a third one is that we collect um, 
reprocess, we collect our single use medical devices and reprocess them. And, and we also buy them back. So last year we bought back 55,000 reprocessed devices to reuse again. Um, and then another example is, is that we created an energy efficiency questionnaire for the RFP. Healthcare devices don't have an uh, energy efficiency standard yet. So we're, we're hoping we can use this questionnaire to be able to evaluate the energy use of our devices in the purchasing decision-making process. So next slide. So through this work um, and through the years that we advanced circularity, we've actually learned a few lessons. Two of the lessons we've learned are ones that are challenges for us, and then the three that we feel like we can push forward. So one of the challenges for us is the lack of eco-labels for healthcare products that really advance circularity, except for EPEAT. Um, so we, we, um, we, we are challenged by that. We agree with CEP's roadmap where we need to harmonize the electronics Eco labels in this capacity to advance circularity. Another challenge that we have is with um, take back programs. We just don't have the space to store goods in our docks or in our areas in our care sites to have the suppliers collect them. But we are looking at other alternatives in that regard. So that's just a challenge that we hope to overcome. Maybe even back hauling through or through empty trucks. Um, but we are also um, pleased to be able to drive and what we can do is we can drive demand. We reached out to several vendors before this webinar and found that they were ex super excited about advancing circularity and, and meeting our expectations in that regard. So through education of our existing suppliers, we feel like we can drive demand and, and enhance more innovation and circularity. Um, we also, like I mentioned before with the sterilization wrap, we can build partnerships with our suppliers and foster that innovation and circularity through those through building partnerships. And then lastly, one of the lessons learned is that we know that we might need to build a business case in order to pursue alternatives. And to build that business case, we might need to look at total cost of ownership. And we found that when we move to reusable isolation gowns, for example, instead of disposable, that we could save up to a half a million dollars by doing that. And that was through looking at a total cost of ownership. So looking at a total cost of ownership may offer the business case for you if you're looking for a circular solution, especially with reuse or energy efficiency as an op option. So I'd just like to close by saying we're excited to dig deep into the resources that were shared today, the roadmap from CEP, the purchaser guide from the Global Electronics Council, um, and also ITU, Circular and Sustainable Public Procurement Resource. We feel like those are going to be be valuable to us and we look forward to using them to reduce our emissions and to improve the health of the people we serve. With circularity, it affords us an opportunity to really to engage our suppliers and foster these partnerships that it takes to, to be innovative and circular. Um, circular solutions really benefit us all. And so we look forward to, to working through that as a, as a large purchaser. So thank you for your time. Beth, thank you. Um, it's great to see all these efforts to help, uh, you know, as, as a purchaser to make sort of better informed, more sustainable decisions, and we're certainly happy to, to be part of that. Um, so now we're going to move on to Q&A portion. We're, we're running a, a little long, but I think um, we're happy to stay on uh, for those who are interested to either ask additional questions or we've got some um, already in the Q&A that I'll reference here. So, so one, I'll I'll just point to a question that was asked in the um, in the Q and A portion of our video conference tool. One is, you know, how is 